How y'all doing this morning? I can't believe you crazy people are awake already in here and ready for the day. You even look good like you took showers and everything. You're, you know, this is awesome. So good to see you. Would you do me one big favor and put your hands together and welcome those who are online today. Thank you from wherever you find yourself. We're a little bit jealous that some of you are watching in your PJs in your bed this morning, but hey, the family of God is here. And today we are going to be talking about the family of God and a big extent. And that was my baby up on the screen just a minute ago. It's so sweet to, to think about, you know, that your kids grow up in the house of God and then, you know, thank God they're continuing on and, and that next generation is kind of taking over and continuing to advance the gospel. So how amazing is that? So um, Adam, if you're watching online, we're excited for you. Adam and his family are in uh, the, the mountains, and they are enjoying a good spring break like many others this week, so we're happy for them and their family. He kicked off this new series last week called Told You So. How many I told you so moments have you had in your life, right? <laughs> Guys, we know what our wife tells us, like, I told you so, right? So they're, they're right, right? We got to put that, we got to put that there, so... Part of this series is based on the fact uh, that we're looking at some of the prophecies of the Bible. And as you look at Bible prophecy, um, it's said that there's over 2,500 different prophecies in the Bible. Over 2,000 of those have already been fulfilled, and some 500 remain unfulfilled. But let me tell you something, they will all one day be fulfilled, right? One day, every single one of those will come to pass. So Pastor Adam did kick off this series. He talked to us um, last week about some very important things. And if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go back there and watch it online. But most importantly, last week, six people ended up giving their lives to Jesus. Would you give God some glory for that? At the end of his message, he did challenge us. He said, would you go out there and invite your friends? Would you invite your loved ones? Would you invite your barista? Would you invite your server? Even if you didn't like the service that they gave you, all the more reason to go out there and invite them to come to church, amen? But we've got Easter coming up or Resurrection Sunday. What a wonderful opportunity where people will come to church that might not normally come to church. And he's put these little cards on each of your chairs. I wanna encourage you to take them give them out in the days ahead, and let's see what God does. May he turn that six into 60 on Resurrection Sunday. If we do our part, I bet God will do his. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you and give you all the glory today. You are our God and King. And as we look a little bit at your family today, would it reflect, change, and transform our thoughts, our minds, our hearts Father, we praise you. You are worthy. This morning, what a blessing and honor it was to worship you with fellow believers, with brothers and sisters in Christ. May we begin today to understand the significance of words like that, like father, brother, sister, family. In this day and age where Satan is working so hard to distort those concepts, Lord, would you let us see through his schemes? Would you help us to overcome would you help us to be part of the solution and not part of the problem? Lord, we love you and we give you this day. Change our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Adam kind of finished off in the book of Genesis. And I'm going to go back there and try to build upon some of the things that he shared. And I'm going to open up with a verse that I preach on an awful lot. Genesis 1.26. They're going to put it up there on the screen in just a second. It says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him give them dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's so much meat, so much substance in that one small set of verses it speaks to our identity. It speaks to who we were created to be. First and foremost, we do need to realize that you are created beings. I want to answer that age-old question this morning. What came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken, <laughs> right? Because it was created. 
You know, I went out there. We have a chicken coop at the house. I went out there the other day, and that thought literally came to mind. Like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And I'm like, the chicken, right? You can't have an egg without chickens. It would not work that way. And I said, what a simple thing that really proves that we're created. Something as simple as that. Once you get that simple concept, it really begins to change everything. There is a God. He is real. He created us. And he loves us and he created us to be part of his family. It says in that verse, you were created and formed in the very image of God to be a reflection of who he is. It's meant to be that when people gaze upon us, they get an image and a glimpse of who God is. As believers in Jesus Christ, that is all the more important, yet we know we fell in sin, right? We'll explore that just a little bit in a moment. But identity right here, he's telling us exactly who we are and where our identity should come from. The schemes of the devil, he never changes. You know, we talk about this. What are the hot button subjects? We're going to talk about a few of those today. Identity, male and female, he created them. Is that not like a big issue right now? It's huge, right? Everywhere there's conversations about that. The devil is trying to distort the very image of God. He's trying to distort who we're created to be. He's trying to create confusion in our hearts and in our minds so that we don't know who we are. It's an age-old problem. We've talked about it so much that there's a war going on in heavenly places. And today we're going to reveal some of the devil's schemes, but more importantly, we're going to reveal God's rescue plan for all of humanity. We do have an identity crisis right now. People don't know if they're male or female or dog or cat or furry. I saw one image of some lady walking around with like a horse mask on, saying she's a horse. You're not a horse. Maybe you act like one sometimes. But then they want us to lead into these delusions and act like everything's okay. And if we don't say it's okay, then we're the bigots. We're the bad ones. We're horrible. And the devil shifts from time to time. Wasn't it not long ago he was trying to pit pit, pit black Americans against white Americans, against Hispanics, against this? Guess what? He'll come back to that one pretty soon too, I guarantee it. He goes in these waves of trying to create division and dissent amongst people, but we can't let them win. Journey Church is an amazing reflection of the glory of God. Look on stage during worship. Look at the diversity that's up there. Look at the diversity that's around you because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we'll go back to that in just a moment. So the devil tries to distort the very image of who God is. And right now, it seems as if he's winning. If you look out there at society today, doesn't it? It seems as if he's winning. Let's move forward just a little bit more. Genesis 2, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Prior to the moment before they sinned, they walked with God. They talked with God, they fellowshiped with God, they sensed that they were part of the family of God, and that's who you were created to be. That's the kind of life that you were created to live. Satan came in by his plans and destroyed that. He created a separation. He caused us to hide from God. And in our sin, don't we do the same thing even with our fellow man today? If you're sinning, it begins to create a separation, right? And it happens in our families. If you're sinning, we separate ourselves from each other. We start to hide. We start to lie. We start to put things back behind, right? Those are not fun ways to live. It's not the life that you and I are supposed to have. We're supposed to live as part of God's family in communion with him. Thus, isn't it also... Very interesting when you start to dig into the fact, what else other than identity does God have or the devil have on constant attack right now? The family, right? You know, there's whole trending movements right now, like even with young couples, and they're going against trad wives and trad families, if you haven't heard that term yet. It's a, it's, 
it's like a slang that's supposed to be a bad thing if you're a traditional wife or a traditional family. They're saying, you don't need, there's whole trend saying, you don't need men in your life. Some of you women are saying, yeah, that's kind of right, no. <laughs> but there's trends in a bad way that are saying like, I can do it alone totally, there's no need for men, let's emasculate men. Let's divide the family. We don't need to be married. There's whole trending videos going out about like young couples that are not married that are saying, oh, Saturday night for us, we get to go out and do this and we get to go do that and we get to go be hungover. We get to go be whatever, acting in, in an attempt to glorify that lifestyle and say that if you're a traditional family, now you're the jacked up ones. This is really trending out there right now. I'm, I'm serious. If, we're, if you're not seeing some of this out there on social media, this is exactly the, the subject material. So just think of the scheme of the enemy. He goes after you as an individual, after your very own identity. Okay, now also it said we created or we were created in the image of God. There was the word us in there. Who's the us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're all present at creation and they created us, right, as part of that. They're the us. They were in perfect harmony with one another. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Perfect community, perfect family. So if Satan can destroy the family, he once again distorts the very image of God. Because when a family is together in a healthy way, it's an accurate re uh, reflection of the Trinitarian nature of who God is. Do you see the schemes of the devil now? Is he revealing them to you? Do you see why he attacks these things so hard? And then we as Christians sit passively by and we don't do anything about it. We can't be silent in our generation when there's an onslaught of the devil's works that are going on. We need to stand up and suffer some of the consequences at times if people say that we're the jacked up ones. No, we're not. We stand on solid ground from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. We need to stand on our faith and not be swayed by the culture of our day, right? Genesis 3.15. This is where Adam kind of left off. It's a prophetic statement. And I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophetic statement that's talking about something that will ultimately happen in the future. Most theologians believe that what it means by Satan bruising his heel generally refers to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That he saw it as a victory that he was going to extinguish the very son of the living God, but God had other plans and he rose again on the third day. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? So he bruised him for a moment. Jesus came as the suffering servant. Why did he come on this rescue plan? This is the initiation of the rescue plan here in Genesis chapter 1. God is saying from the very beginning, right after man falls in sin, I'm going to send a rescuer. He's going to get bruised. He's going to get battered. He's going to be afflicted in the natural he is going to be so distorted that when you look at him right before the crucifixion, you will no longer even recognize him because he was bruised for your iniquities. By his stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. By his blood, you are forgiven. So Satan thinks he's getting this momentary victory. So when we're talking about, I told you so, when we're talking about these prophecies that have been fulfilled, at the time it's spoken in Genesis, it's unfulfilled, but we have hindsight now to know that that particular set of scriptures came true. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? That prophecy was fulfilled and the son of the living God coming and dying on a cross and rising again that we could have relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He gives us more glimpses of what was to come in Genesis. And he talks about her seed. He's talking about this earthly lineage of Jesus and where he would come from and how we would know when he's there. Genesis 12, he refers to this in Genesis 12, chapter 1. Another prophetic statement. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. 
to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Already going to start to lead in. What land is he talking about? Give me a guess. Who knows what land is he talking about? What one? Israel, right? He's talking about Israel. What's in current events today? We're going to explore that in just a moment again. Another attack of the enemy, as you're going to see in just a moment, an attempt to destroy the family of God in the land in which they were promised in Abraham. The stuff we're talking about when we get to current events in just one minute goes so far back, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? You have Isaac and Ishmael, right? The two that were there. Two different nations that came out of Abraham's bosom, so to speak, right? They're still at war and enmity with one another even today. From all those days until now. The stuff we're witnessing in current events is prophetic in nature. A lot of the things that we see out there, we deem to be political in nature. Political subject matter that's going on when we talk about these big major issues. But really, it's spiritual in nature. There's a spiritual battle that's going on behind, and the devil wants you to think it's political, and he wants to divide us amongst left and right, right? He wants to separate us and keep us from understanding the truth where the roots are spiritual and deep that go all the way back to the verses that we're reading here today. Are you all still tracking with me today? It's another prophecy. A prophecy where Jesus is revealing the lineage, or God is revealing the lineage of Messiah, who would be of the Jewish people. Jesus is Jewish. Do y'all know that? Are you sure you know that? The enemy would have us distort that. Throughout the ages, have we not seen God guide, protect, and bless the Jewish people? Have we also not seen attack after attack after an attack in an attempt to extinguish the Jewish people off of the face of the earth? Recent history, Hitler, right? Didn't he try to do it? Others are trying to do it today. So when you get to some of the conflicts and what we're going on today, when you see the Arab-Israeli conflict, as it's often referred to, Ishmael is the Arab nation, and then the Jewish nation is Israel. But guess what? Even the name Israel means is real. God is real. People, come on, Jesus, right? (laughs) Sometimes they put it right before your face. Talked to you about the Apple phone before, right, too? How many of y'all got the Apple phones? Some of you heard me say it before. Go look at the symbol that's on the back of it. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. A bite out of the apple. They put that stuff right before your face. They do. It's right there before us for all to see. And sometimes we just scan over it. It doesn't mean it. Yes, it does. I'm telling you. The devil puts that stuff before our face. That wasn't supposed to be in my notes today, but come on. We've seen wave after wave of demonically inspired individuals try to destroy the Jewish people. As we look at these different scriptures, most of them have been fulfilled, right? Some are playing out before our very eyes, and some will not be completely fulfilled until the second coming of Jesus when he returns to this earth to make all things right and new. Jesus' birth through the lineage of Abraham is outlined in both the books of Matthew and Luke. We read over those sometimes because it's just so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. How many of you have ever read those? But all those begat so-and-sos end up being an I told you so. (laughs) Jesus prophesied or God prophesied Jesus would be born and all those things lead up to an I told you so. He's here. He came. He loves you. He died that you might have life. Jesus' birth and victory over hell, death, and the grave is prophecy fulfilled. In fact, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his life. For those of you who like statistics, in order to do that in any one human being's life, the statistics are such a magnitude that it would never, ever, 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 you'd you'd like never win the lottery, except that he's there. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's talk about current events for one more second. That verse concluded with saying, those who bless Israel shall be blessed. Those who curse Israel shall be uh, cursed. 
Right now, we find ourselves in the midst of an Israeli-Palestinian war. There's no, no other way to put it, right? It began on October, um, October the 6th, right? And the, the Hamas invaded Israel, and then Israel's response, you know, some are deeming it disproportionate. You know, I don't want to get into the political aspects of that, and we're not to necessarily support all that the Israeli government does because the Bible even says all that are Israel are not Israel, meaning that everyone who claims the name, even as believers, I've used that analogy, not everyone who claims the name of Jesus is of Jesus. Do you realize that? They might claim it, but they're not it. So I'm not saying we have to endorse every single thing that they do, right? But when you hear statements like from the river to the sea and people chanting those out, do you really understand what you're saying? Sounds good, right? But that means from the Jordan River, which is basically the eastern border of Israel, to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, they want to wipe all of Israel off the face of the earth. They want to have genocide against every single Jewish person. That is demonic, people. When you're shouting from the river to the sea, and there's been an amazing set of propaganda. They said if you watch TikTok for more than like 30 minutes, you will become like a Palestinian supporter almost immediately. Like the propaganda is there so much, but again, let's go back to the beginning for a minute, people. God, de the devil wants to distort the image of man. Look at how many attacks he's simultaneously doing all at one time. Why is he doing so much right now? Because the end is near. That prophecy of Jesus coming back for the second time is about to come true and he knows he's about to get whipped once and for all. So he's going out there doing his last bit of slashing and doing everything that he can. But there's a whole generation of people that completely and utterly have been brainwashed to support the Palestinian efforts in spite of what's going on. Ishmael wants to take out Israel. So even when, you know, we, in our Western theology, we think to revive Roman Empire, we think that the, the, that, you know, the, the Antichrist will come and will be some Western Roman European person. Guaranteed it will be an Arab person. It goes back to that. Why do you think the Muslim world is growing so much right now? Why do you think they're taking over everything? Why do you think Europe is opening up all the borders and America is opening up all the borders and letting everybody flood across all these things? It's the setup for the end, that one world government. It's all coming to pass in our lifetime. Israel has been reborn, prophetic event, right? We've talked about that one before. But he's, he's convinced a whole generation of young people, even say people who claim to be gay young people. They're out there saying, free Palestine, go out there, this is what's going to, if that same gay young person who in America, luckily we live in a land where people could be free, that people could do it. You know, in Israel, gay people could do what they want there. They could have any different opinion. They have freedom of religion there just as we do. They have freedom of expression there just as we do. They don't kill people because they d disagree with what their, their belief system is, right? But if that same young person were to be in Palestine, literal video of people throwing gay people off of buildings to kill them. But they're brainwashed here by our, our universities and all the other societal stuff to say, yeah, go free pals. Those people would kill you. Do you not understand? <laughs> Women that are out there, promiscuous. I saw a video of a semi-promiscuous woman claiming, you know, going all off about Palestine, going off about all this stuff. And the other lady is making the argument. She was Iranian. And she's saying, you live in a country where you could sit on a podcast and you could be dressed half scantily clad and you could promote these ideals. If you were in Iran, they would kill you. It's like, but the devil has so convinced people that this is okay, that these things are right. But it says, he who blesses Israel shall be blessed. He who curses Israel shall be cursed. I don't know about you, but I'm going to bless Israel. If that's what God says. Not all of their policies, because not all of their policies are good, but the genuine people of Israel, the genuine people who are longing after the God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm going to pray for their salvation. I'm going to pray for Arab salvation too. Come on, Jesus. We need people of all backgrounds to get saved and come to know the Messiah for who he is. Because when he does, this is where we're going to get into it. So we're, if you're say, from the Palestinian, well, I'm going off today, boy, come on. You start to go on the Palestinian cross. Do you know that you as a believer in Jesus Christ are now Jewish? Yes. 
We started off with these words, brothers and sisters. Did you hear me a little bit earlier? I used those importantly because I'm going to go back to them in just a second. That's not figuratively. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you become a brother and sister with the person that is sitting next to you. Doesn't matter their background. Doesn't matter if they look different than you. Doesn't matter where they're from. You are now brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, you're stuck with me, people. We're stuck with each other. But I'm going to give you evidence in just one second before we close that the Bible talks about us as Gentiles, as non-Jewish people being grafted in to Israel to become adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords, part of the very family of God. You and I are brothers and sisters with the Jewish people. You can't think about, you can't be chanting from the river to the sea That's like, go kill me, because once they're done with them, guess who he's coming after next? If Satan were to win, once he extinguishes the Jewish people, he's coming after all the believers because you were created and formed in the image of God. You reflect the image of God's glory. You're the opposite. He wants all the worship. Is all this making sense to you today? Woo. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. The rescue plan was to save all of us who are sinners and make us part of the very family of God again. I think of Luke chapter 15, verse 20, the story of the prodigal son. I want to bring this message back to family. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, another verse says he came to his senses and then he arose. His father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This wasn't just for him a wayward son or daughter. All of us are wayward sons or daughters. Before you came to know Jesus, you were a wayward son or daughter. And one day, and maybe for you, some of you in this very room, today's that one day. If there's not a lot of people here whose first time is a one day, then we as believers have some jobs to do to expand our family. We need to see some more brothers and sisters come to know Jesus. We don't have to wait for them to come to their senses and come to us. We could go out into the pigsties. We can go out into the city. We could go out there and bring them in and bring them home. And that's part of our job as believers in Jesus Christ to go out there where they're at and live our lives as believers, reflecting the image of God in such a way that draws them unto the King. Are you living your life in such a way that draws them to the King? I pray you are, Journey Church. Go out there and live on mission. But God is calling us home, He's calling us back to His family. And what a family it is, right? What a family it is. He's standing there with open arms. If you're that sinner out there that's still doing it, if you're that sinner that's out there far from God, even if you claim the name of Jesus and you've ran from him, guess what? He's standing there with open arms welcoming you home today. He's saying, come back to me. You don't have to live in the pig pen any longer. You don't have to live out there in the world any longer. You can come home And he's waiting for you to come home, not to beat you down, but to welcome you into his loving arms. Romans chapter 11 describes a family tree. The Jewish people who were chosen by God, many who have turned the other way, many who are still far from God. And it says that God has not forgotten them, that in the end days he will come back and he will give them eyes to see and ears to hear. And we need to pray for that day. But in that same set of verses, the Bible says, we who are Gentiles were wild branches that God has grafted in, right? Here's the image that I want you to get today. He's he's talking about trees. Let's go back to the garden where we started. There's the tree of life. There's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And for so long, we've been living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil that we can't even see the tree of life any longer, right? Right? When he's talking about this tree, they're part of that tree. And if you don't know the grafting process, I don't really know it all that much, but I know this, like say you could take an orange and a lemon and say you cut the lemon 
part off and you cut a little bit of the branch on the orange tree and you can actually graft that tree and you'll have an orange lemon hybrid. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> like, but it makes it work. Like God's saying, this wild set of branches is coming back here. This wild set of branches that's been living in the knowledge of good and evil, that's been walking in evil, that's been walking in sin. When they come to know him, they could be grafted back into the tree of life. And you could live in the tree of life from that day forward and into eternity. Remember, he had to cut their days short because if they went back in there and they ate of the tree of life again and they lived forever, it would have been a bad thing. If you go back and read that scripture, it talks about that. But now we can. We could take a bite of the fruit of the tree of life again and have life and be part of the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ and in him. Ephesians chapter 2 does a good job of describing what happens. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made by flesh in the hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of God's promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished his flesh, the enmity that is the law and the commandments contained in the ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God through one body on the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and those who were near, for through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. This concept is called the one new man. Jew and Gentile, one in Christ, Brothers and sisters. So if you hear people out there who are believers or others saying from the river to the sea, like you're talking about going and killing your brother and sister. It's insanity. It doesn't make sense. We're part of the family of God. You and I are adopted Jewish believers. You're adopted. You're welcome back into the family. You are a wild branch that's now part of the very family of God. We close with this. Or let me read the last part. I missed the last part of Ephesians. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows in a holy temple of the Lord and whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. You are the temple of the living God. Final one, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not of the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live in according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit of himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children of God, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Indeed, we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together in him. Man, I pray God penetrates your heart with those scriptures today. You're part of the family of God. You were created and formed in the very image of God to be in communion with God, to walk and talk with God to hang out with him, to fellowship with him. Sin has separated us from God. He wanted us to live in a fatherless generation so we couldn't get a picture of who the father really is. He wants to distort our image by making us no longer male or female. He wants to destroy the family because it's a reflection of the family of God. He's on an all out attack against us, but in Christ we have victory. God sent his very only son to go behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to save you and me. And we're in a real war. And we're called to go out there 
behind enemy lines that go out there and bring others and rescue them and bring them to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is. Adoption is an incredible thing. I never met my father until I was 40 plus years old. I met him one time for one hour and that was it. That was it. At age five, I can remember being there and going to school with my mom, like to bring me as a single mom and other parents or other kids had like dads. And I'm like, wow, this is strange. <laughs> like something's wrong with me. Like, where's my dad? I don't get this. Like, this is weird. It led to a bit of an identity crisis, right? We weren't meant to live that way. We weren't meant to be separated from our father, but that's what the devil does to keep us from understanding who God the father really is. At age five, my mom met a Jewish man. They dated each other for eight years. At age 13, he came to me and he said, Eric, I'd like to marry your mom. Would you approve of that? I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah. And then he did another amazing thing. He said, the day after we get married, would it be okay if you take on my name? He goes, I want to adopt you. Would you, would you do that? And I was like, you mean somebody wants me enough that they want me to be a part of their family? So they got married, and the very next day we went to the lawyers, and they changed my name. I started my life as Eric McGee without any, and they made all kinds of fun of me as a kid. Yes, they did. Mr. Magoo was popular at that time. And I had glasses back then. I need them again. Come on, Jesus, I'm getting old. But they changed my name. I became Eric Jaffe. A literal depiction of what I'm talking about today. We were once Gentiles that are grafted in. Jaffe is, is the people whose last name is Jaffe are from the city of Jaffa in Israel. It means beautiful. It means loved that he cared for me, that somebody wanted me to be a part of their family. That's how God longs for us and longs for those who are far from him. That's why it's so important that we go out there and try to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ and draw them in that they could experience the spirit of adoption and understand that God wants them to be a part of his family. He wants you to be a part of his family. He loves you that much that he sent his son to die for you so that he could become your brother. He's a brother that was willing to die so that you could be part of the family. How crazy is that? You don't have to go on walking out there. We live in a fatherless generation. There might be many more people in the room like me that never really knew your earthly father. I'm here to tell you that God, your father, still loves you. Whatever the devil tried to do to distort that, to keep you from understanding who God really is, I'm here to tell you that God still loves you. God is still on the throne and he wants to adopt you. He's coming to you right now as my dad, Dan Jaffe, did and saying, can I adopt you? I want you to take on my name. I want you to be part of this family. If you've never done that before, man, I pray today you'll say, yes, I want to be a part of the family of God. Would you rise with me and bow your heads for just a moment?